2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We've been going through 2 Timothy on Sunday nights, and this is not part of that series, but I just wanted to start with the first two verses of 2 Timothy. Quite a few of the letters in the New Testament have something similar like this that they say. And uh, I want to draw your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I'm speaking to you this morning about our Father in heaven. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. It's just the introduction to the book of 2 Timothy. And he talks about our, our Heavenly Father, God the Father, and His grace, mercy, and peace. Uh, th this week I heard an interview of a, of a man who's written a book called The Prince Boofhead Syndrome. <laughs> the Prince Boofhead Syndrome. And what it is, he's found a, a pattern that there's a lot of young men, particularly, who are very rude to their parents. His experience was he, he drove up to his school for whatever reason, and he just happened to get there at the same time as a, as a lady pulled up, and she phoned uh, to get her son to come out and pick up a book that he had forgotten. And uh, she, she mentioned to him that she had to miss an appointment to bring it, and uh, he came out, and his response was, you stupid idiot, that's the wrong book. And he stomped off. And he began to notice that this was not uncommon for particularly young men, I, probably young women too, I don't know, to treat their parents with great disrespect. And he, he wrote this article or book called The Prince Boofhead Syndrome. And, you know, as I heard that, I thought, you know, sometimes we're like that with God. God blesses us. God is our Heavenly Father. It, I read these, these verses because it talks about three amazing things that God makes available to us. Grace, mercy, and peace. And only God can give those in an eternal sense to us. And He does. He offers them to us. And yet many times, Lord, why did you let that happen? Some little thing will happen and, boy, we're crosswise with God. We, I think sometimes we get the, the prince or princess boofhead syndrome. If you don't know what that means, talk to me afterwards. It's, it just means you're, you're not nice to be around. Grace, you know, is, is such a wonderful thing that God gives us good things, even though we don't deserve it. Mercy, you know, His kindness, His forgiveness, He, he withholds judgment that we do deserve. God is very gracious and, and merciful, and God offers us peace. And if you want peace, the, the real source of peace is the Lord. Security, assurance of salvation. God blesses us. James wrote, we know that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Any good thing you have, God supplied it. We need to be careful that we don't treat our Heavenly Father with disrespect and dishonor. Uh, often, I think, we respond to God like that boy did uh, to his mother. You know, uh, human fathers, we understand, really, they should be honored. Now, it doesn't mean that every father is honorable. They're not. Uh, if you're a father here this morning, you know there's times when you're not, haven't been. Uh, even if he's not honorable, you honor his position. Now, our Heavenly Father is always honorable. Uh, we have no problem there. But you know, for fathers, our goal is to be godly men, it should be. Uh, in, in your box there, and I don't open it right now, but uh, men, I put a, a list there, God's real man list. <laughs> Somebody's put this together. Real men love their wife. Real men teach their children God's ways. Real men don't use words to hurt others. Real men don't let their anger get away from them. A whole list of things, and, and scripture verses there to, to help you see. Uh, you know, real men... It's not who you can beat up or you know, how big or how tough you are in a physical sense. It's having character. It's being like the Lord Jesus. And that's our goal. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Uh, Peter wrote, 
he's talking about the end times, how the whole world's going to be burned up. And he said, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If this whole world's going to disappear someday, what difference is it going to make who owns the most of it? <laughs> it's going to be gone. You can be the richest man in the world and it won't be there. Uh, you're not going to take it with you. Uh, we need to be godly men, uh, real men. And you know, your heavenly Father is the example that we can look to. Uh, we're going to, uh, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17 is actually where I'm speaking from. And uh, this probably won't be a real long message, but we'll, uh, we'll be done pretty quick here. But uh, Paul in Acts chapter 17 was in Athens. Now, I think Ray and May had uh, left this morning for their 10th anniversary trip. I was saying to somebody, boy, people do different things than we used to. Yeah, man, our 10th anniversary, I think we probably had a coffee. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, they're, they're going to be in Athens and Iceland and all kinds of places. And you know how it is. You go to Athens and you look at the whatever those buildings are and all the marbles and, and you cover your eyes from all the naked statues and uh, all those kinds of things. But uh, Paul was a little different kind of a tourist. Acts chapter 17, look at verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. See, Paul wasn't worried about the architecture. He wasn't worried about how famous the place was and getting picture postcards and so on. He saw that in that city there were lost souls. And it was very obvious and let me say this, you go to just about any major city and it's really obvious that people are hurting. People need the Lord. Uh, just about any big city in the world, you go there and there'll be somebody who's insane walking down the road talking to themselves and shouting at the walls and, and you'll see homeless people and you'll see uh, prostitution and you'll see all of this, this wickedness. That's what Paul saw in Athens. He wasn't worried about, you know, there's things that were there then that are still there now. He would look at the same things you could look at when you, you go to Athens now. But that wasn't what concerned him. It was that there were lost souls. Now these were educated people, these were probably wealthy people, but they were heathen because they didn't know the Lord. They were given to idolatry. You know, I thought about that in our world. We're, we're facing a, a spiritual crisis in Australia. And we can look around, we can say, oh, these homosexuals, you know, they're troubling us. Or we can see lost souls. We can see troubled souls. People who need the Lord. They're not our enemies. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It, there is a spiritual battle. And like Paul, we need to have our eyes open. You know, you can look at the politicians and think, oh, you know, they're deceiving us or they're doing this or that. Or you can see lost souls, people who need the Lord. You can look at your neighbors. Listen, it's easy to have trouble with your neighbors, doing something you don't like. You can see that or you can see a lost soul, a person who needs Christ. I, I would encourage you sometimes just to sit at the shopping center and try to see those people like God sees, sees them. He knows them by name. He knows their character. And he, he knows that their character will not get them to heaven. And so he sent his son for that very individual who is just like you. God, give us hearts uh, for people. And as Paul went to Athens, he saw lost souls. And he begins to speak to them. Now, it was, is it uh, Sydney where they have Speaker's Corner? Or is it London? Or, anyway, and, and sometimes in big cities there's places uh, where people will go and they'll, they'll talk. Maybe they'll talk about communism. Or maybe they'll talk about Christ. Or maybe they'll, you know, they'll just talk to people. Well, Athens had a place like that. And in, in verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. That was the place where you could address people. And said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now, now, Paul was not criticizing them. He was just saying, I can see you're very religious. He saw all the, the things. Verse 23, For I passed by and Beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. 
He, he comments on their, their religion and on their worship. And you know, he noticed something that I think is the God most people still worship today. The unknown God. I think a lot of people think, oh, there's probably a God. But they don't know him. They don't know who he is. Now, let me give you three things this morning. We're, we're looking at our Father in Heaven. And uh, three things. Number one, you must believe that God is. Hebrews 11, he says, but Without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Number one, we need to believe that God is. Number two, we need to believe who God is. It's not enough to make up a God yourself. You need to find out who this God is. And then thirdly, we must believe what God is saying. We need to believe that, that God is. Uh, let me give you an illustration of this in, in Mark chapter 12. You know, Jesus often had um, conversations and, and uh, times when he would have to deal with different people. And in Mark chapter 12, the Pharisees and the different religious leaders were kind of trying to give Jesus a hard time. And uh, one of them, in, in Mark 12, verse 28, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Now, this man wasn't as hostile as some of the other people had been. He, he, he actually was just interested. And Jesus gives him the answer that you're, you're familiar with in verse 29. Uh, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And he gives the second and the man says, that's a good answer. Basically, there in verses 32. And he says, um, in Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, in verse 34 says, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And what he's saying to him is, here's a person who believes in God. He just doesn't know him yet. He has a belief in God. He that cometh to God must believe uh, that he is. And that man, he said, he was able to say to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But you know, we, we need to not only believe that God is, we need to believe who God is. If you look back at Acts chapter 17 there, Paul, as he talks to people at Athens, he begins to tell them about God. Acts 17 verse 24 he said in verse 23, This is the God I'm declaring to you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and, and, and all things. Let me read on down. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices." He begins to tell them who God is. And one of the things he says to them, he's not like these idols you're worshiping. He's not like a, a statue. God is the one who's blessed us. And he he's, starts off there in verse 24. He's the creator. We looked recently at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. As you look at creation, you see there's a God uh, who is amazing. You know, if this is the sin-cursed world, I can't imagine what it was like before sin. You know, what an amazing world physically that we live in. God made uh, the heavens and the earth. Uh, there's a statement, just, just listen to it. It's from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. You'll be amazed how, how, how simple this is. Every house is builded by some man. <laughs> That's not real deep, is it? You look at a house, you know somebody built it. But he that built all things is God. <laughs> you know, it makes sense to look at the world and say, who made this? I want to know him. I've heard of people like that, where they've just looked around and thought, 
there's a God who made all this. And they've even prayed and said, God, let me, let me know you. And you know what God does? He sends a preacher. He sends somebody with the Bible. And they say, I'm here to tell you about that God who made heaven and earth. We've been wanting to know that one. <laughs> what an amazing thing. That's who he is. He's the creator. In um, the same, uh, same verse there, verse uh, 24, he's Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, he's, he's the ruler. He says in, in verse 26, that he's, uh, he's determined the times. Uh, you know, we, we know that he, he decides what happens and uh, how things work. You ever wonder why it's a seven-day week? You know, the French one time tried to have a 10-day week. Didn't work. They, they wanted to go metric, you know. <laughs> Didn't work. God just made us that way. He, he's the one who set up the week. He worked six days and he rested the seventh day. It wasn't because he was tired. He was setting the pattern. 24-hour day. 365 day or whatever it is, year. You know, God set the planets in motion. He's the creator. He's the ruler. And he's the one who's all-powerful, who's all-knowing. He's everywhere present. You know, he says here, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The whole universe couldn't, can't contain God. How could a temple contain him? You know, we talk about going to church and, you know, that's, that's good. But church is people. It's not a building. We don't come here to find God. God's everywhere. He's uh, particularly in his word. He's the, the one who gives life and, and breath and all things, he says there in verse 25. He's the giver. Any good thing you have, it's from God. We need to know not only that God is, but who He is. He's the creator. He's the, the giver. He's the controller. And Psalm 31 says, my times are in thy hand. And isn't that the truth? You know, some people live, uh, Thelma lived to be 90 years old. Um, my mom and dad lived almost, almost that, 80, 89 years. Um, some people live 89 minutes. Our times are in His hands. Uh, and we need to thank Him for it. We need to know who God is. We need to know as well what God is saying. You see, God uses words. <laughs> God communicates to us. The Bible even says, this is an amazing thought, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Logos, the Word. But He's also given us the written Word. Jesus has, has given us His Word. In verse 27, He is the Revealer, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him. He says, even your own poets have, have said, uh, in whom we live and move and have our being. And people understand, uh, there is a God. We can know Him. God has revealed Himself. Uh, he says for us to, to seek the Lord. And He says He's not like statues and idols. He's like us. <laughs> now, that's kind of a weird thing to think about. He doesn't look like us. God is a spirit. But God is a, a three-part being. Yeah, and we're a body, soul, and spirit. We're different than the animals. We're different than these chairs. We can know Him. And God made us to know Him. Uh, I think I've mentioned Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the, the firmament Show us His handiwork. We can look around and, and see there's a Creator. There's a, an amazing God. But then in that same chapter, He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God has revealed Himself particularly through His Word. If you know something about God, it's because God revealed it. God wrote it down. And then God particularly revealed Himself. God was manifest in the flesh. That was Jesus. And oh, we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, He's the center of history. And the Bible says that it someday every knee will bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. We have a Heavenly Father. He made this world. He has a, a good purpose for you and for me. I love Jeremiah 29. Let me just read it to you here. Jeremiah 29, verses 13 and 14. It says, Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. God's not playing hide and seek with us. 
God is there and he, he wants you to know him. God has made himself available to you. He's manifest himself. Don't let him be the unknown God to you. you know, as Paul went to Athens, he could see they were very religious, but they didn't know the Lord. They were so religious, they were worried they'd miss a God. You know, they believed there's all kinds of gods. So they made one to the unknown God. He says, that's the one you need to know. That's the real one. That's the one who made heaven and earth. Don't let him be the unknown God to you. Yeah, there in verse 30, he says, the times of this ignorance God winked at. It's just saying God has been very patient with us. God gives us time. You know your rebellious life? <laughs> My rebellious life? God has given us time. He's overlooked it to a, in, in, a, in a sense. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. If the psalmist said, O Lord, if thou shouldst mark iniquity, who shall stand? You know, if God would, would just kill us just for our first sin, that none of us would, would get past childhood, would we? But God is patient with us. He's kind. But He will judge the world, the Bible says, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world. Verse 31. He'll judge the world in righteousness. He'll judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath appointed. Now, who's that man? It's Jesus Christ. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Christ came, he, he lived perfect life. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. That's, uh, that's God's proof that this is God's plan. This is God's man. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. That means he's going to judge you. He's going to judge me. By that man, Jesus Christ. Now, what a blessing. Well, as, as Paul preached this, verse 32, people began to respond. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed. And he named some, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demaros and others with them. People had different responses. And this morning, I'm sure, various ones of you will have different responses. Uh, some will respond with contempt. Oh, I don't need that. Others will question. I'd like to know more about this. Others will have curiosity. Some will be converted. Maybe this morning you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Listen, your Heavenly Father deserves your honor. I've been a, a father. And my kids are grown. It's kind of fun now to tell people, yeah, my baby's 37. <laughs> you know, uh, they grow up real quick. And, you know, looking back, oh, I wish I'd been a better father. I wish I was a better father now, you know. Uh, one, one Father's Day, I got such nice cards from my kids. And they said such wonderful things. You know, I love you. I, I want to be like you. And, and it, really, it broke my heart because I thought, if they really knew me, if they knew the heart of this man. And yet we can look to our Heavenly Father. And He'll never fail us. He always loves us. He knows every wicked thought and action and deed that we do. And, and He loves us. And He's made a way for us to be forgiven. What a wonderful Heavenly Father we have. Listen, don't go home without knowing Him. Not only that He is. Not only who He is, but what He said. And God has said that we all need to repent of our sins. All have sinned. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What a blessing. What a blessing. God gave His Son for us. I, don't, I hate to end on a funny note, but listen, don't be a Prince Boofhead. <laughs> don't be one who God blesses, and, and He does. He blesses us all. Grace, mercy, and peace. Don't treat him with disrespect. Honor. Honor your Heavenly Father. God's blessed you. He's made grace, mercy, and peace available to you. Uh, God is. You can know who he is. You can know what he's saying. 1 John 5 says, These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That believing you might have life through his name. Ephesians, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I want to encourage you this morning. 
Uh, trust Jesus Christ. In, uh, when we started there in, in Timothy, uh, he made sure that we understood that they're one and the same. Uh, from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful Savior. This morning, maybe you need to trust Christ. Uh, we're going to sing a song. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to be dismissed. Uh, but listen, don't, don't walk away without the Lord. If you know the Lord, be a grateful child. Be a grateful child. What a wonderful Heavenly Father we have. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, thank You so much for your, for your grace and mercy and peace. Thank You for the gift of Your Son. Lord, what a blessing that we can know You. Lord, we look forward to heaven. Father, we struggle in this life. Uh, Lord, we don't understand all that goes on, but we know, uh, we know that You're faithful and true, and that You have eternity in store for us. Father, if there's those this morning that are not saved, I pray... Lord, help them to see their sin. Help them to see that they need you as their Savior. Help them to believe. Pray this in Jesus' name.